Crossroads family, how y'all doing? You good? Man, it is a huge honor uh, to be here, here this evening. Who's having a great time so far? Is anybody having a great time? Come on. Honestly, that was awesome. I'm, I'm pretty proud of y'all for that. You know, there's places I speak and you're like, how is it? People are like, eh, it's all right. So I think you're actually having fun. All right, well, here's my hope this evening. Is it all week we've had fun? Uh, we have played lots of games and laughed and, and just had an incredible time at camp. But here this evening, I believe that the God of the universe has a word for you. That every single person in this room, that he is going to speak right to your heart this evening. And here's my ask for you, is just open up your heart for him tonight. I don't know what he's going to speak to you exactly, but I do know that he is going to speak to you. So if you would, would you open your hands up just like this in a posture of, hey, God, if you've got something for me tonight, I want it. And let's pray real quick together. King Jesus, we are here for you. It is your kingdom, it's your word, it's your spirit. And God, we want to hear from you and encounter you tonight. And it isn't just a talk, it isn't just a, a time we come together and we leave unchanged, but rather when your word is preached and your spirit is here, God, crazy things happen. God, speak to us here this evening. I'm weak, you're strong. Speak right now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. How many awkward people do I have in here? Do we have any awkward? My people. Here's what y'all need to know about me. All right, rein it in. I'm a very awkward person. When you hang out with me, like, I'm kind of socially awkward just a little bit. And I love that there's so many awkward people here. Come on, we can clap for awkwardness. I want to tell you a story, though, of the most awkward situation I've ever been in in my entire life. And it happened on my honeymoon. Oh. Y'all don't even know what's about to happen right now. It is way worse than you're thinking. Uh, but I have a beautiful wife. I think we have a picture of her that we can throw on the screen of my wife and Evelyn, who's my little girl. There they are. Yeah, your boy is blessed. That's what y'all need to know. Yeah, aren't they pretty? I don't know how I had a part in that little girl. She's gorgeous and acts a lot like her daddy, so pray for Evelyn, please. <laughs> but anyways, we had a great time on our honeymoon. We had a great wedding, and then we went on our honeymoon, and we just had a great time, and like, we're just like on uh, the honeymoon high. You know what I mean? Like, oh my gosh, we're gonna change the world. We're gonna, like, we're gonna, like, we're in love. You're in love, I love you, you love me. Let's get a dog named Marley and a white picket fence, and let's just live the American dream, and this is going to be Incredible. And that was our plan. Head home from the honeymoon and start our beautiful life, yet we had to come through customs. It gets worse. It gets, I promise, it gets worse. And you know, for most people, that's not a big deal uh, because you come into the country and, uh, you know, Head up to the counter, and all the people ask you a few questions, and then they kind of let you back into the country. But we get up to the counter, and they ask us a few questions, and then they're like, hey, do you mind hanging out in this small little room for us with like three other people? And I was like, uh-oh, this might not be so good. An hour later, homie calls me up to the counter, just me and not my wife, uh-oh, number two. And he says, hey, do you know why I'm holding you right now? 
I was like, nah, bro. I just got married eight days ago. I'm on a honeymoon high right now. I'm ready to go start my life. I don't know why you're holding me. And he said, you have an active arrest warrant right now in North Carolina, and I may have to arrest you tonight. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Clayton knows this story. This is a true story. But I was like, bro, like, this can't happen. I just got married. I'm going to have to go tell my wife of a week who was homeschooled her whole entire life (laughs) that her pastor husband is going to get arrested in the airport. He was like, okay, well, have a seat, and I'll make some phone calls, and then I'll try to get you out of this whole situation. I was like, "Uh uh-oh. So I went and told my wife. I was like, baby, you know how... Now, like, I have a past and stuff. Um, I might have to get arrested tonight. And she handled it like a champ, though. Listen, she was like, all right, I'll get you out. I'll call the lawyer. I'll break down the walls. I said, homeschool what? This is why I married you, woman. Like, this is awesome. An hour later... The sweet officer comes back up, except this time he's not alone. He has other officer friends with him and handcuffs out. And I literally got arrested on my honeymoon. This is a true story. This was an awkward situation. All right, all the type A people are like, you can't leave it there. you got to tell. At the end of the message, I will finish the story. I promise. (laughs) All right, if I forget at the end of the message, you can raise your hand and say, nah, bro, you don't give that invitation right now. You tell us the end of the story. I promise I'll come back to the story. But this was an awkward situation. I'm on the honeymoon high, coming back with my beautiful homeschool wife, and we are planning our whole existence together. Life is going to be amazing, except instead I found myself in the middle of an airport with handcuffs on. This was an awkward situation. If you have a Bible, Let's flip over to Luke chapter 15, because we're going to look at another awkward situation. A lot of you guys have heard this passage preached probably more than I have. Luke chapter 15. The context of this passage as you flip there is that Jesus was a real person. He actually lived on earth, right? He's not like Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings. He is like a real dude. I know I just offended some of y'all. That's okay. He was and is a real person and spent time on earth with the sketchy people of his time and day, the outcasts of his day. So here in this passage in Luke chapter 15, Jesus is spending time with all the alcoholics and the drug addicts and the LGBTQ activists. He's hanging out with those people that the religious people kind of looked a little bit down on. He's hanging out with the outcast people. And as he's spending time with them, the scribes and the Pharisees come up to Jesus and start grumbling at him. And they're like, wait, wait, whoa, 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 wait a second, bro. You're hanging out with those people? Like, 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 you gonna hang out with that girl? Do you know her past? Or her present? Or her last night? And hold on, hold, hold, hold up, hold up, hold up. He's hanging out with that dude? He clearly is not the person he claims he is. Picture how awkward this experience would have been. Here's Jesus claiming he's a teacher. That he's this ultra-spiritual guy and he's hanging out with the 
prostitutes and the alcoholics and the outcasted people and up come the scribes and the Pharisees and, and all of the religious people. And he hops up and he explains these three stories all having one point. And the question he's trying to answer in these stories is how does God feel about those people? How does the God of the universe feel about the outcasted people and the lost people? And you've heard this story a hundred times, I'm sure, but the prodigal son's story is one of the ways he answers that question. He explains this story about there's a man who's extremely wealthy and he's got two sons. He's hanging out one day and uh, the younger son comes up to him and says, hey, dad, I want my inheritance early. I know you have all these rules and your, you know, house is pretty cool, but ultimately I wish you were dead. I need my inheritance early, Pops. And he hands it to him. And the scripture says that a few days later that he leaves his father's house and he's like, finally, I got some real freedom. All these rules, all this stuff he's been telling me to do, I cannot live it up in here, but I can go out there and live it up. So he leaves and the scripture says he squanders his wealth. He spends it all, he parties it up, he goes out to all the wildest parties and he spends all of his money and then he runs out. And he's like, all right, what am I gonna do now? And he's gotta get a J-O-B. He works in a pig pen. He's out of money and he's like, man, I can't even eat. I'm homeless, I don't have anywhere to go. What should I do? And he starts to think about home, how Christmases were. How family meals were, they didn't have Christmases back then, but you know what I'm talking about, the family holidays. And he starts to just kind of think, okay, how, how can I get back home? Because this stuff out here isn't all it's cracked up to be. And he heads out of the pig pen, he's like, all right, I'm going to go back home. And he starts to head home and he plans this speech in his mind of, man, I'm going to tell my dad that I'll be a slave outside, I don't care. I'll be an orphan, I don't care, I just want to be around the house, I just want something to eat. And as he comes closer that he sees his pops running at him, and he probably thinks at this moment, here it comes, I'm going to get screamed at, I'm going to get yelled at, he's going to hit me with something and say, get out of here, I can't believe you spent everything. But as he gets closer, he sees his father's expression on his face a little bit. And it isn't one of rage and hate and anger. It's one of love and a lot of compassion. As he gets closer and closer, he heads right into the arms of his father. And there's this huge moment of a hug and a kiss and they throw a party. And in this awkward situation of Jesus hanging out with the rebellious and the religious, of the outcasted people and the prostitutes and the drug addicts and then the super, super spiritual people, he's answering the question, how does God feel about lost people? And here's his answer. He gladly welcomes them home. He loves the lost. He finds the lost and he welcomes them home with open arms. And a whole lot of us here have a story like that. This is your story and my story. And here's a little taste of my story. From an early age, I had this horrible speech impediment. And you know, people would be like, hey, what's your name? And I literally could not tell them. I would say, <laughs> literally could not get words out of my mouth. On every single phrase, I stuttered, and I had crippling anxiety because of that, that ruled my life. But on top of that speech impediment and all that anxiety, I had this emptiness in my soul that I really didn't understand why it was there. I mean, at an early age, I made a decision that, hey, I'm going to try to get all the pleasure from this world as possible. And I chased after all kinds of different things. Popularity. But as you can tell, I'm kind of awkward and I'm a little nerdy, so that didn't work out so well. 
It's like, okay, sports are going to be the answer. But as you can tell, I'm short and white and can't jump, so that didn't work out so well either. So it's like, okay, sports aren't it. Popularity isn't it. So then I started trying other things. And eventually I smoked weed for the first time, and I thought I had found my answer. It's like it kind of calms me down a little bit. The hole in my soul shrinks even just for a little while. And I was always the kid that was only going to do that. Only do weed. I'm not going to do harder drugs. That's the only thing. But very quickly, it led into harder and harder drugs. And as a 16-year-old in high school, I became a heroin addict. And uh, that I found myself in a mental institution for. And I was in and out of treatment centers after that, trying to find a way to get free. And I tried everything, uh, but I eventually hit rock bottom. I was 100 pounds, right? So the same height as I am now, but about 85 pounds lighter, half a human. Had track marks up and down my arms, and I still could not speak. And I felt a lot like this kid in the pig pen. Just, I thought that happiness would be found out in the world, outside of my father's house, and what I found is actually emptiness and a lot more pain and brokenness. But on Christmas Eve of 2010, I was invited to a church service. I wasn't raised in the church. Um, I didn't really have an understanding of who God was or anything like that. But I went that night because there was pretty girls and great music is what they said. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm in for this church thing. That sounds like a good plan. But I went that night and I heard about a God who loves screwed up people. And I heard about a God that he does not ask you to clean yourself up first to come into his kingdom, except rather he says, come as you are and I'll clean you up. And I heard about Jesus, how he was crucified on a cross on my behalf. And all I had to do was place my faith in him and he would make something beautiful out of my life and I could be reconciled to the God of the universe. And I did that night. I placed my faith in Jesus on Christmas Eve of 2010. And I'm telling you, that was 11 and a half years ago. And there ain't nothing has been the same since. That's King Jesus. And hopefully a lot of you guys have a story like that. Hopefully it doesn't involve like heroin and drugs and all that type of stuff. But hopefully at one point in your time, in your life, that you were like this kid and that you were lost, and you came to yourself. And you had that encounter like 180 of you guys have had this week, is what I heard, of how you came into a relationship with the God of the whole universe through Jesus. But here's the thing that I want to focus on tonight, because I've heard this text preached a zillion different ways, and hardly ever uh, do people highlight the verse 22. So I want to jump into this real quick, man. Do you all mind helping me read this real quick in verse 22 in Luke 15? It's going to be on all the screens. I would love it if you could help me read it. All right, you all ready to read with me? That didn't seem so excited as you did at the beginning. Who's ready to help me read? Okay. All right, let's do it. One, two, three, read. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Uh, There are three things in this passage, this long passage that we just read, that I'm going to highlight here this evening. Three presents that the God of the universe has on offer for you and I, three presents of identity that he has for you this evening. And if you're a Christian, these three things are already yours. And if you aren't a Christian yet, these three things can 
be yours this evening. Hold up number one for me real quick. Hold up number one. All right, one is a robe. Robe. You tell your friend next to you, a robe. A robe. How many people haven't taken a shower yet at camp this week? Anybody hasn't taken a shower yet? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Some of y'all raised your hand. Clayton, they just confessed up in here, bro. All right. Question number two. How many people aren't planning on taking a shower at all this week? Anybody just not, not taking a shower? Come on. I'm with you back there. You just spray Axe all over you. It'll be fine. I promise. All right, rain it back in for me. Imagine how smelly this kid was when he came home. He had been rolling around in pig poop for weeks. This is a true story, right? Imagine how much he smelled, how it was probably in his hair and under his fingernails and in between his toes. Like this guy, and he didn't even have ax to spray all over him after he stunk so bad. But I love how the father responds to him. I don't know about you, but if I'm his dad, I'm going to be like, bro, here's what you're going to do. Head in the house, three showers, three bottles of cologne, and then I'll hug you and kiss you and all these things. But rather, his father ran to him in his mess, in the brokenness, right? And then what does he do? He doesn't say, all right, change your clothes. We're going to go in there. We're going to take all that stuff off. You're going to take three showers, and then I'm going to give you this robe. But rather, he said, no, 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 right now, bring the best robe and put them on him. And I just believe that robe was not like a poncho that you get for 99 cents at a game or something, right? It wasn't those hotel uh, horrible robes that 300 people have worn and then you go to the hotel and you put it on too, which is kind of nasty. I picture this as like a supreme robe. It was supreme or it was like, uh, you know, the highest price, uh, the most expensive type of robe. It had fur all around the neck and was like purpled silk or something. I just picture it being real bougie. Anybody picture the same thing? Come on. But scripture says that prior to meeting Jesus, all of us are like that kid. It explains in Isaiah that even our awesome works are like filthy rags. But it also says in Ephesians chapter 1 that after meeting Jesus that we are holy and blameless without a spot or blemish. I remember that when I was about uh, to ask uh, you know, my sweet wife to marry me, that I had about three or four things in my life that I hadn't really told a lot of people. There's a few things that I knew that prior to asking her to marry me that I was going to have uh, to tell her these things, and I knew that there was a chance where she was going to cut it off because it was really bad things that, uh, that I didn't want to tell anybody. But I took her on a walk one day, and I was like, hey, babe, I, man, I just got to tell you these few things. And I know we're getting pretty serious, and we're heading towards marriage, and I just feel like you need to know these three or four things that I've only told a handful of people I think you should know. And I, I explain these things with tears in my eyes of these things that I'm very ashamed of even to this day. I explain these things to her that I did this, and this was done, and all these things. And I will never I mean, forget how she responded. If I'm her, I would have said, all right, you need to give me a few weeks to process this. Or it's over, you're like, that's too weird, we're, we're just going to split that. But how she responded is that she looked at me and she said, yeah, but that's not who you are anymore. The scripture says that you are holy and blameless without a spot or blemish, that the old is gone and the new has come. That's not who you are anymore. And I want to speak 
on behalf of Almighty God to you this evening. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care how bad it was, how gross it was. Scripture says that if you're in Christ, you are clothed in righteousness, that you are holy and blameless without a spot or blemish. And all of us have a couple of those things that we're like, I can just sweep that under the rug. I don't want anybody to know about that. He knows about it and he loves you anyways. I don't care if you stole or you lied or you cheated or pornography stuff or other sexual things that you've done. Scripture says that if you're in Christ, you are holy and blameless without a spot or blemish. You have a robe on, Crossroads. It's covered. And I really believe there's some people here that it's not something you've done. That's a thing that has been done to you. That you're ashamed of it. And you've kept it a secret and you feel gross and you feel like it's, it isn't ever going to be okay. I want to speak on behalf of Almighty God that if you're in Christ, it's paid for. You are covered. You are not used goods. You are holy and blameless without a spot or blemish. All right, hold up number two. Point two is a ring. A ring. Will you say ring? If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. I should join the worship team, don't you think? Charlie, what do you think? Where's Charlie at, man? Do you think I could join the worship team and, and, and you know, do a little solo? All right, real quick. I'm short on time, so we've got to move faster. You have to listen quicker, guys. All right, so first he said, hey, here's a robe on your back. It's got the fur. It's got the purple silk on that mug. And he's like, I don't care how dirty you are. Let's clothe you in this. He said, then he puts a ring on his hand. As he came home, he was expecting, hey, I'm just going to be a slave in this house. I'll be an orphan outside. I don't care what I do. I just want to be around this. Except rather what happens is his father invites him in and says, no, no, no. You aren't a slave or an orphan in this house. You are my child. You are an heir. And I love you like a child. It explains this in John 1. I think we have this scripture that we're going to throw up on the screen. Maybe not. There it is. Explains this, uh, that to all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Crossroads, look at me. If you're in Christ, you are a child of the Most High God. You you are not a slave who has to just follow all the rules and you don't have any intimacy with the Father. And you are not an orphan who has to earn everything that he gets, except you are a son or a daughter in the family of God. And here's the beautiful thing, is that if he's the king, you are a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God. Touch your neighbor and tell them you're a prince or a princess. I should have known better than that. I should, all the guys said princess. That's what they did right there. All right, rain it back in for me. I knew it. I knew it. The princess wasn't going to work. Hey, Crossroads, look at me real quick. I want you to feel this in your heart. I think oftentimes as Christians that we know God loves the world, right? But we don't think he loves us personally. He loves you personally. And he doesn't just love you. He likes you. 
He likes to spend time with you. He likes having you around. He loves you and he likes you. All right, hold up number three. We're almost done. All right, how many sneaker heads in the house? Anybody just love sneakers? Okay. Okay, I feel you. I feel you got the hey dudes on. Who's got some Jordans on in the room? Anybody got Jordans on? My man got some Jordans. Let me see your Jordans. Let me see your Jordans. Got to stick them out in the aisle right there. Okay, okay. You got Jordans? Oh, those are, those are blue. I like those. I love presents. Absolutely love presents. All right, come on, y'all. We're almost done. I love presents, uh, but I have to say my favorite present I've ever gotten is a pair of sneakers. I think we're going to throw them on the screen right here. These are retro Jordan 17s. Yes. I wish I would have kept them, y'all, because I looked online the other day, and those things are going for $800 right now. It's like, dang. As he comes home, though, do y'all imagine how nasty his feet would have been? Pig poop up in between his toes. He had ran all the way home and probably had scars on his feet and cuts all over the place. But scripture says when he gets home that his father puts a robe on his back and a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Ultimately saying, I've equipped you for everything that's in your future. Man, can I be honest with you? Following Jesus is not easy. It isn't just rainbows and like, oh my gosh, I'm just, I love the Lord all the time. Like, man, sometimes it's a dog fight. And it's hard. But this right here is explaining, hey, I don't care how rocky it gets, how hard it gets. I have equipped you for every single And I'll just speak this as well, man, that I feel like there's a bunch of you guys that are going to be called to do some crazy things for Jesus in this room. I believe there's some people in this room that he's going to call you to do some things that if he told you right now what they were, you would freak out. Be like, I can't do that. that that's, that's way too big. That's way too far. I don't know if I can actually say yes to that. It isn't going to be easy, yet he's equipped you for this journey. Our culture right now in America especially is comfort addicted, self-focused, and pain averse. Everything we do in life, the place we live, who we hang out with, is all framed around ease and comfort. But here's the thing I want to tell you, is that Jesus is inviting you on an adventure. It's not going to be easy. It isn't going to be comfortable. It's going to be hard. Yet he's equipped you for every single thing. It explains in Romans chapter 10 how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And every Christian in, here in this room and in the entire world, he's called you to preach the good news. He's called you to share your faith. I remember uh, that when I first felt called into ministries, about three months after I got saved, I'm still coming off of the drugs and all these things, and I start to hear the Lord uh, speak sweetly to me and say, hey, I'm calling you to share your story and preach the gospel. I mean, I remember being like, yeah, God, great idea, but your boy, like, I can't even order a hamburger at a restaurant. I stutter on literally every single word. I cannot do this. And he ultimately said, I made your mouth. I can do anything I want with you. And I just want to encourage you guys, this hasn't been easy. It's been a challenge. There's been some hard seasons for sure. But he has a calling on your life. And I don't care how scary it is. 
how much you're like, no, I, I, I could never do that. He has prepared you for every hard thing, beautiful thing, and this purpose he has in front of you. Because of Jesus, one, you are holy and blameless without a spot or blemish. I don't care what you did, you are holy and blameless if you're in Christ. Here's point number two. And because of Jesus, you are a child of God. You're not a slave, you aren't an orphan. You are a prince or a princess in his kingdom. And then three is that he has prepared you for everything in front of you. I'm going to close with this, though. I'm going to finish the story. But I really believe there's some people here who you just feel trapped. That you're like, man, I hear what you're saying, Pastor. I hear that you're saying that I don't, you know, I'm holy and blameless. I don't have to have all the guilt. And I hear that you're saying that I'm a child of God. I'm not an orphan and all these things. And, 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 and I hear what you're saying. He's got a purpose for me. I, I get all that. But if I'm honest with you, I just feel trapped in the pig pen. I just feel stuck. I've tried to get out, man. I've tried hard. I've tried to claw my way out of the pig pen. But if I'm honest, man, I just kind of feel like I keep sliding again into all the pig stuff. You feel trapped. And if I'm honest with you, that's how I felt in that airport that day. I had these high hopes of what life was going to be like. I have a white picket fence and a dog named Marley, and I'm going to change the world with my wife, and it's going to be in, incredible. But instead, I was, I was in the middle of the Charlotte airport in handcuffs, and I felt trapped. I tried everything to get out, too. I was like, I'm just going to slide my hand out, and I'll just run when I get out. I tried that. didn't work. I, um, I tried to argue my way out. I was like, hey, bro, listen, like I'm, like, I'm a pastor. Please let me go. He was like, no. I was like, man, I had a quiet time this morning. Please let me go free. He was like, no. I was like, man, please, please can you let me go free? I, I just got married a week ago. He's like, that's cool, but no. I was like, man, I've been clean like six years at this time from hard drugs. He's like, No. So four hours after he held me, he said, man, I'm going to have to take you down to the jail now. And I was like, okay. And we hopped in the cop car, and, and uh, we headed down to the jail where that was going to get processed and, and all those things. And uh, just when we got there, though, uh, the officer at the jail came up to the arresting officer and just kind of whispered some things to him. And I was like, oh, no, it's worse than I thought. Uh, but he came over to me afterwards and he said, man, I'm so sorry. There's been a huge mistake uh, that I'm going to have to unarrest you right now. And I was like, I don't care the reason. Just let me go back to my wife. But I asked him, I was like, so why? Like, what happened? And he said, well, I did a two years ago uh, that your case was brought up to a judge and uh, that he heard your case and he heard all about you and uh, you heard about your story and uh, that you had done some really bad things. But after hearing your story, he slammed down the gavel and said it's paid for. It's forgiven. I don't hold this against him anymore. Time served. And how I was able to go free that day, guys, it isn't that I was real spiritual or I tried really hard to get my hand out or I had a quiet time that morning. The only reason I was able to go free was a few years prior. I had a person who had authority slam down the gavel and said it's paid for. And if you're here and you feel trapped in your sin, the only way to get out is not your effort 
It isn't trying harder. It's not if, man, I just try harder. I come to more camps and do all these things. How you get free is only through Jesus. 2,000 years ago, a real man named Jesus hung on a criminal's cross. And all of your sin, all the things you've done, all the horrible, rotten things were put on Jesus on that cross. And as he hung there, the God of the universe, who is a just judge, who is holy, he slammed down his eternal gavel and said, it's paid for. I don't hold this against you anymore. You are completely forgiven. This is the gospel. This is how you're made right with God. It isn't through your effort. It's through Jesus. There's a real God who made everything in the universe for his glory and our joy. And he made you and I to have a perfect relationship with that God. Yet all of us have turned away from God and said, no, I don't want you. I just want your stuff. I think I'm smarter than you. I'll do my own thing. It's called sin. And he's a holy God, um, and therefore his wrath is on all sin, and that ends very poorly. Yet, he's also a loving father. And he loves you and I so much that he sent his son Jesus here to live a perfect life in our place, to be crucified on a criminal's cross, to be put in a tomb, to hop up from the grave, And what he did is he paid for your sin and he allows you to be reconciled to the God of the universe. This is the gospel. It isn't through your effort. All you gotta do is leave your pig pen and run into the Father's arms. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, I pray right now that you do what only you can do in this room right now. Uh, that f for the people here that aren't yet in you, draw them to salvation. You died on the cross, you rose from the grave in order to reconcile us to you. And that's where true life is found, God. For the prodigal in the room that has a relationship with you yet has turned away and now they're in the pig pen again. God, would you draw them back home? It's your kindness that leads us to repentance, God. And would you just speak kindly to them right now? With all heads down and all eyes closed. I mean, if you're here and you know here's the night, I've played church for a while, but here tonight I'm ready to to actually hand my life over to Jesus. Then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It isn't the prayer that saves you. It isn't if you get all the words right, then you're a Christian. It's not a spell. It's a heart posture. If I know I'm a sinner, I know I can't save myself, and I'm placing my faith in Jesus, I will follow you because you are the life I've been looking for. With all heads down and all eyes closed, if that's you, then just pray this in your heart. He hears you. He's here. He's closer than your closest thoughts. Pray this to him. Heavenly Father, I need you to save me. I know I'm a sinner. And I know I can't save myself. But I believe that you can. I believe you died on the cross in my place. I believe you rose from the grave. I repent of my sin and I place my trust in you, Jesus. And have my life. With all heads down and all eyes closed, man, if you just prayed that to him, would you put your hand over your head for me in order that I can see it? Straight up, man, you're not the only one. Would you just put it all the way over your head in order that I can see. Anybody else? Would you keep it up for me just for a minute?
incredible, incredible, man. Uh, the pastors in the room, the youth pastors, man, if you can just look around and, and if that you have a student that's raising your hand, their hand, uh, would you just kind of take note of it in order that you can have a conversation with them later? Hey, guys, let's head back into worship right now. Fifteen students just responded to the gospel tonight. Can we give Jesus the credit for that? Hop on your feet for me as we head back into worship, man. But I want to tell you this. The scripture says, heaven throws a party only when one sinner repents. Heaven is throwing a party here this evening. Let's join heaven in partying for those people who came into the kingdom. I love you guys.